We got it. <clears throat> All right. Welcome to our city council meeting. It is Tuesday, August 18th, 2020, and it is 7 p.m. We'd like to welcome everybody that's here in attendance. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're missing one council member tonight. Council member uh, Bowman is, will not be with us tonight. Uh, but we can still do business. So we'll get started by uh, a Pledge of Allegiance. Is there anyone here that would like to lead us in that? I Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman Meekham. Uh, we'd also like to have a, an invocation or an inspirational thought. Is there anyone here willing to do that tonight? Going once, I'll offer it. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful this night to be able to meet together as residents and elected officials and, and staff members to have this city council meeting. We're grateful for the freedoms we enjoy, for the country we live in, and the opportunities that afford to us. We're grateful, Father, for the city in which we live and the good people that are here, and we pray for them, that we'll be safe and that we'll be healthy. We're grateful again for uh, all the blessings that we enjoy we pray that thy spirit will be with us this night, that the decisions made will be what's in be the best for the city. And we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Are there anyone here that has a declaration of conflict of interest with anything on the agenda? Okay. Our consent agenda tonight, uh, we have the, the minutes of our city council work meeting from August 4th, 2020. We also have the minutes of the city council regular meeting on August 4th, 2020. Has the council had an opportunity to read those? And if you have any changes, or corrections, additions. All right, we also have the bills for $1,143,309.80. Any questions or concerns with the bills? Okay. Also on our consent agenda, we have item 5C, which is a resolution 0805-2020, a resolution approving a reconveyance of property to CJM property. Any questions on that resolution? Okay. I look for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. We have a motion by Councilman Miller. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Councilman Meekham. Any further discussion on that resolution or any other items? If not, Councilman Hathaway. Aye. Councilman Meekham. Aye. Councilmember Montoya. Aye. And Councilman Miller. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. Our public forum tonight, uh, we had a, two emails sent in. Uh, so <laughs> go ahead. You want to go up there? Our recorder, Aaron Shirley, will read these. Okay, first comment is from Lee Ann Piper. Um, she is talking about the Gray Cliffs development, from what I understand. Um, it came in uh, actually on Wednesday, the day after all those flood of emails uh, from the last council meeting. I just want to add that context because she doesn't name the development by name, but so it makes more sense. She says, I like some of it. Questions arise as to tons of dirt and stabilizing it before building on it. Uh, that was a pretty good landslide at the park. The grade would have to be massive infill to hit maximum grade. The pictures make it look like old South Lake Tahoe. That concept works with a lake and casinos just fine. No lake on the mountain here. The fire restrictions requested for vegetation near a dwelling would not allow a forested setting. 
Three, the light-up Maverick would not support much more traffic. With the diesel pumps, the semis are already attempting to come out of the north exit of that lot. When school is in session between semis and school buses and C.S. Lewis, that light backs up going southbound past the school intersection. Four, would the structures blend into the atmosphere or you can put on, or can you put on a red roof? Five, no garages. Six, the fault line was acknowledged but not addressed. I'm sure I'll have more thoughts. Uh, and then the second comment is from Jeffrey Sidaway. Uh, and he says, esteemed council members, first of all, I'd like to clear, like to be clear that I'm not a lawyer, but I am a thinker. That being said, I'm curious if it is legal for the city to include an ordinance or basic contractual clause for development agreements that would require the agreements to be revisited if the development is ever sold to another developer. Please allow me to clarify. Having lived in Summit Ridge for the past 12 years, I've noticed that every single time we get a new developer, the master, changes, master plan is changed and the promises in quotations made by the previous developer have no legal standing. It's been explained to me that a part of the problem is Summit Ridge in Summit Ridge is the fact that the entire area was zoned as a PUD, which allows the developer to in essence set their own zones. So even though there has been a realtor sign at the bottom of development to sell 70 plus acres of commercial slash retail land for the past eight to 10 years, all of that land is now going to be townhomes. When residents complain, we are told that this is due to a decision that occurred 20 years ago and then nothing can be done. Let us act now to prevent future city councils from having to give the same reasoning. Residents resent hearing that the city is beholden to past actions, whereas the developer can do whatever it wants when it wasn't even around during those past actions. If the problem there is, in fact, the PUD zoning, then I would hope that we stop using PUD in the future. With the general plan being updated this year, please consider discontinuing that zoning designation. If the problem is not with the zoning itself, but with the development agreement, then let us learn from past mistakes and adjust our behavior for the future. Consider a clause in any future agreement that void the developer agreement upon sale of the, of the development, or at least build in those restrictions that don't allow for the developer to make changes to the proposed master plans. Personally, I think that the zoning upfront is one of the best options with very specific residential zones that allow or disallow specific types of housing in each zone. I'm not a legal expert, but I'm sure there is something the city can do to correct these situations going forward. Summit Rich is just one example of promises from developers not being kept. Similar cases can be found in most, if not all, developing neighborhoods around San Aquin. Please keep these long-term effects in mind when making immediate decisions. Thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you. Would you like to answer any of that, those questions there? Or statements in that? Um, <clears throat> I, I think there are uh, several points that were well taken. Um, certainly, Santa Quin City has learned from the from the past many of the issues that we've dealt with um, over the last uh, ten years that I've been here, and I know twelve from Norm when 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 I talked to Norm about this um, has been trying to catch up from some of the decisions that have been made back in two thousand and twenty when the Summit Ridge development came in. 2000. Um, or 2000, I'm sorry, 2000, and uh, the subsequent change in 2006, uh, when when that first amendment uh, took place, <clears throat> and we've been we've been dealing with that ever since. And I think many of the actions our current council is taking um, to be prudent in evaluating annexations and things like that, uh, making sure that we have infrastructure plans in place and uh, mitigation plans in place, are are very prudent and and well warranted. And I think that. Um, those experiences in the past, um, we didn't have a, a large staff or a large community um, at that time. I think they, they made the best decisions that they could at that time. And so I don't fault the decisions of the past, but with every decision comes a consequence. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, every decision has a consequence. And um, and some of those consequences have been very good. It's, a, it's There's wonderful areas of our community that have been inviting and and welcoming to new people to our community, which has made our community that much stronger. But there are some of the things that we've we've inherited that maybe aren't so pleasant and that we're still trying to deal with. And so um, long story short, I, I agree with the comments that are made that uh, um, when we do development agreements, um, that we ensure that uh, they're enforceable and that they're not vague. <clears throat> um, it is important to note that uh, there are what's called assigns and successors to agreements. So the agreement that was put in place with the original developer years ago 
had assigned the successor and the current developer has all the responsibility and rights that go along with that development agreement. So um, um, they have to uh, uphold many of those things uh, that, that are in there and, um, and we hold their feet to the fire on those things. Um, but <clears throat> there were many things in that original agreement back in 2000, which are vague. A bubble chart, for example, has always envisioned high density being in the area that's coming in but it's just that it's a bubble chart. It's not really a legal description or anything. So um, all we can do is learn from the past and make it yeah. better in the future. Correct me if I'm wrong, but development agreements go with the land, right? They do. Not with whoever purchases. That's it's exactly right. Development agreements go with yeah. the land and it, it goes with the land regardless of its um, whoever's purchased it. And in the case of Summit Ridge, there was actually a bankruptcy. So it kind of split mm -hmm. into pieces as well. And that's some of the reasons why the second access to Summit Ridge didn't go forward because of a bankruptcy. So, so Mayor, one clarification yes. on that as well. Um, Mr. Sidaway indicated that's a PUD. It is not a PUD. It is a planned community zone, not a planned unit development. There is a distinction in our code. So I want to make sure that, that that's clear. It's actually a PC zone, not a PUD zone. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I, I know there's a little confusion with the public about what this uh, public forum is. And our city protocol uh, states this about the public forum. This is a portion of the city council meeting in which members of the public may address the council on items of city business, which are not listed on the agenda. And that's uh, and then item A uh, underneath that is time limit. This portion of the meeting is limited to no more than 30 minutes total for all speakers, with each speaker given no more than five minutes each. If there are more than six speakers, time will be adjusted according to meet the 30 minute requirement. If the non agenda public forum item will exceed 30 minutes, it should be rescheduled as an agenda item on a future council meeting. Uh, item B, speaker sign in. Uh, persons wishing to speak under the public forum should sign in at the start of the council meeting. Uh, item C, presentations. Presentations under public forum are limited to uh, no more than five minutes without council approval. And we already went over that. Uh, written comments, uh, members of the public may so submit, uh, which we had tonight, uh, emails that were submitted. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the COVID-19 and, and it's an easier way for the public to be able to be uh, express their views as well. Uh, repetitious comments is the next item. Uh, a speaker shall not present the same or substantially same items or arguments to the council repeatedly or be repetitious or uh, dilatory in presenting their oral comments. If a matter has been presented orally before the council, whether the council has taken action or determined to take no action, the same or substantially the same matter may not be presented orally by the same person any further. In order to exp expedite matters and to avoid repetitious presentations, the designation of a spokesperson is encouraged. With the consent of the presiding officer, the time allocation may be extended for a designated per spokesperson or for the forum uh, duration. Uh, the next item is non-exclusive rules. The rules set forth are non-exclusive and do not limit the, in, the inherent power and general legal authority of the council or of its presiding officer to govern the conduct of the city council meetings as as may be considered appropriate from time to time or in particular circumstances for purposes of orderly and effective conduct of the affairs of the city. Then um, it goes on down. Um, it, it doesn't talk, I, well, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, there are our response to any of the questions that may be asked. And we did respond to the, the a few things tonight, but what are the general rules on that? <clears throat> so all of these rules that the mayor is referring to are called the council protocols. Uh, it is passed by, uh, it's the uh, rules by which the city um, 
uh, elected leaders uh, conduct their meetings, Robert's Rules of Order, if you will. And uh, those can be found out on our website for the public's view. They're also kept here at the podium at all times for the public to review as well. Um, we invite the public to participate. This is your time, and this is the time for the public to share your thoughts, concerns about these items that maybe aren't on the agenda and that we can um, hopefully put on an agenda item in the future. But generally speaking, the general rules are that we do not respond. We respect the, the public's right to speak during that period of time. And the purpose of that is because, um, one, the comments are being hit cold to the council. Two, the discussion might take place in an, uh, on a non agenda item, and maybe there's other members of the public that want to participate and wouldn't be uh, able to participate because they didn't know it wasn't posted properly. So it would be inappropriate for the council to respond. Um, but mostly it is um, the opportunity for the public to speak without being spoken to. It's for us to listen. And, um, and to take your words and, and counsel into consideration for future possible action on a future agenda uh, when we can invite all the public to participate. It would be appropriate to explain the difference between a public hearing and public forum, maybe? Um, public forum is, is something that is at the beginning of our meetings per protocol. It's an invitation from the council to the public to come and participate. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Attorney Rich, I don't think that's required by the state. It's an invitation by the council to participate in a public forum. Uh, it's not a requirement, uh, but we, we welcome uh, the, the words from the public. Um, a public hearing, on the other hand, is a requirement for certain actions of the council. And many of those land use public hearings are held at the planning commission level. And that's the opportunity for the public to come in. It doesn't have the time limitations that a public forum has. And, um, and we, we advertise those pursuant to uh, state statute so that we invite the public at all times on those, those required actions. Um, and uh, we have one actually, a public hearing coming up uh, next week on an annexation, for example. Um, that one will actually be held here at the council. Next okay. meeting, I'm sorry, not next week. Anything to add to that council, any thoughts? I think it's good to, you know, inform the public and hopefully we can continue to do that on occasion to inform that because we want to hear your comments. And if we don't respond, I, I think uh, some feel that we don't care. And uh, I can assure you we do care and we do talk about it. Maybe not right then, but we do talk about it. Mayor, if I might add one, one other comment okay. and that is, um, uh, our council has work meetings um, where it's a more informal setting. We have trainings, we show videos from the Utah League of Cities and Towns or from the state auditor's office, uh, open public meetings, uh, training, uh, all sorts of different things that we, we go over in a more informal setting. And um, one comment came uh, to the city this past week, not in public form or public hear hear uh, hearing format, but just a comment in general that uh, the public would like to participate in those meetings as well. Um, it's been difficult with our camera system to be able to uh, have those meetings um, because we've, we've done those in the basement where we could be a little bit more spaced out. Um, but we have a new camera system that the council has ordered using CARE Act dollars, and that will be installed in early September. Um, it won't be ready for this next meeting, but it will be for the meeting after. Um, but we will be relocating our work meetings up here just so that the public can have confidence um, that uh, the public business is being discussed in the public forum, which it always has been, and, and the public has always been invited to the work meetings. Um, but uh, they'll be able to view those as well. Um, it makes it a little bit more uncomfortable in here because we're watching videos and whatnot. But I, I see this as maybe a great opportunity for the public to receive the same training um, as the council is receiving um, with regard to how to conduct this meeting and and um, what the rules are coming down from the state, what things are being considered by uh, our state legislators. And, um, and so we can bring the public right along side by side uh, by having those work meetings. So great suggestion coming from the public and, um, and we're basically trying to listen and, and be responsive. All right, thank you. Anything else on that? Okay, we have uh, awards and appointments. Pace and Sanquin Chamber of Commerce, you're up. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm Josh Nielsen. I'm the president of the Payson Sanaquin Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for getting us in today. We normally uh, appear the first council meeting of the month, but we were 
getting our ducks in a row this month in terms of the business of the month plaque and everything. And so um, we're here today. So thank you for that. I'd like to invite Jim and Loretta up with White Feather Rocks um, and for this presentation. Um, for the business of the month in August, we're I'm proud to present that award to White Feather Rocks here in, in town. As I think of a rock, I think of there's many metaphors and analogies you can use. And the most common is probably strength and stability. They're dependable. And that's certainly something that I would consider with Jim and Loretta. You can count on them. They're dependable to, uh, to, to participate in community events, to uh, from teaching things to our elementary students, uh, scout groups, all of those things. They're very dependable in the service that they provide. When you ask them to do something and they say they'll do it, they, you can count on them that they're going to follow through. I think it's a kind of a testament to that little area. We've got right at center and Main Street where they're at and they've been at for a long period of time. And what you want right in the middle of your center of your city is a business like White Feather Rocks that you can sort of build upon and, and, and grow from. The other thing when I think of a, a rock is you take something that's ordinary or very common and, uh, and you take it and make something special out of it or have special meaning. And I think that's true with our cities that we are, there's cities across the nation, obviously. And what makes our city special are the unique aspects of our city. And White Feather Rocks is certainly something unique and special about Santa Quinn. There's people from all over that know White Feather Rocks that come to our town because of them. And even when I'm giving directions to my office, a lot of times I'll just say, I'm a couple doors up from White Feather Rocks and people know exactly right where I'm at. So it's a great, uh, a great business, they're great people and we're, we're proud to present to them the business of the month from the Payson Santa Quinaria Chamber of Commerce. Free speech. Good luck following that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, That's why he's the attorney. Yes. <laughs> um, we couldn't do it really without the chamber. Um, they've been supportive networking. I encourage any business to join the chamber and get the support and training we need from them. Great. So we thank, appreciate Thank them. you. <laughs> Jim, do you have anything? No, about the only thing I've got to say is that uh, we're small. We've gone ahead and we've hung in there. We are keep growing. We're not like Macy's. <laughs> but you know what? We're going to keep on growing. Good. And uh, we're just developing slow, slowly but surely. Okay. And adding to the city itself. Okay, We're thank you. Popular. Yeah. All the way up to Salt Lake. Yeah. Would you meet me right here for a picture? If you would. All right, we have a, a few appointments to make. Uh, we have an appointment to the Historical Preservation uh, Committee Board. Jeremy Coombs, are you here? Jeremy, come on up, if you would. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, we've uh, been in Santa Quin for close to 17, 18 years now, and uh, moved to here from from Pace, and I'm originally from Southern Colorado, uh, but we've lived more more time in Santa Quin than pretty much I've lived anywhere else at this point. So uh, we've raised all four of our children here, born and raised in, in Santa Quin, and we're about to send our first one off to college. So um, I work in, uh, in Provo for a translation company. We do intellectual property translations, and uh, I've been there for 
20 some years now as well. So it's a little bit okay. about me. Okay. Any questions, council? I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Jeremy and uh, I didn't have an appointment for him at the time and I just wanted to get to know him. And, and so when this opportunity come up on the, the historical preservation board, I thought of Jeremy and how he could fit into that. When I called him uh, about it, he said, you know, it's interesting that my wife and I were just talking about that, uh, historical buildings and preservation and, and stuff like that. And so I, I think that Jeremy will, will be a great uh, asset to that board. And I present him as uh, a member to you. Uh, and I look for a motion for that. Mr. Mayor, make a motion that we accept uh, Jeremy Coombs. We have a motion by Councilman Meekham. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Montoya. All in favor say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Thank you, Jeremy. You're in. Uh, so, so, Jeremy, there's also another member of the board here tonight. Yeah, so that's right there. awesome. <laughs> He's going to be getting a hold of you. Okay. And we're, we're right, right wrong. So we're oh. good. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right. I don't know, is Shay, Shay here? We also, I met with uh, Shay Jackson and appointed her to the library board. And uh, she's uh, lives in Summit Ridge and uh, has a family and uh, involved with the library already. And so I think she'd be a, a good asset there. So we look for a motion on that appointment. Mr. Mallock, I'll, I will make a motion that we confirm the appointment of Shay Jackson to the library board. Thank you. I have a motion by council member Montoya. Do we have a second? I'll second it, Mayor. Second by Councilman Miller. All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. Let's see, award of the architectural ser service contract for the design of the new city hall, WPA architecture. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, um, we're pleased to have our new city hall moving forward um, with some of the council actions that have taken place. But one of the very first actions that we need is a design. And, um, and so through our, our bidding process that we mm -hmm. did um, to have uh, qualified architectural uh, firms um, submit under pre previous projects, uh, one of the firms that uh, was um, uh, deemed qualified to participate is WPA Architecture, Ron Jones, who happens to be um, um, a, our, our chair of our Historic Preservation Committee, as well as someone who has attended school at our uh, now museum, um, <laughs> which brings a great element to our community. Um, we brought this before you for uh, your consideration um, with regard to how to move forward with our architectural services. And um, what is before you for your consideration is awarding this contract to WPA Architecture. And um, that would be at a 5.9% of the um, cost of the project, which is um, uh, below industry standards for the cost of architectural services. and. Um, and that would, uh, is anticipated uh, at a um, $45 million building. And um, as uh, the building, if the building uh, gets larger in size based on grants or uh, other uh, financial um, means that are provided to us, either from federal resources or state resources um, or donations, um, and uh, that maybe project scope um, is modified in any fashion, it would maintain that 5.9% percentage. Um, uh, Mr. Jones is here this evening and can answer any questions that you have for him, uh, but we're excited to have him participate, someone who understands and knows who we are as a community and can help to bring the heart back to our community um, as, as um, shared to us by uh, former council member Chelsea Rowley. Um, since this new city hall will be built in, our, in the heart of our community at, at the location near the museum, um, which is, is the old historic fort location of Santa Quinn. Um, so we're very pleased to present that to you for your consideration. Okay. Any questions or comments uh, for either Ben or Ron? I think we're pretty satisfied. 
we're excited to see what you can, you can come up with on that. So, yeah. <laughs> Yes, go so, ahead. And we're, sh we're shortchanging Ron. He happens to be on our architectural review committee as well. He, he wears many hats <laughs> and, and serves our community wonderfully. Obviously, with him being the architectural review, he probably won't be given the same sort of insight since he's he's the architect. But uh, we we value his his expertise and his professionalism in, in, in that uh, particular um, uh, area. So. Okay. Well, we're excited. And... Uh, would we look for a motion on that? Mr. Mayor, I'll make two motions. Okay, you got her. Um, we accept or, or we award the architectural service contract to design a new city hall to the WPA architect. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Meekham. Do we have a second? We have a second by Councilman Hathaway. All in favor say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Thank you. Uh, item 6D, Award of Centennial Park, Utah Jazz Basketball Court Construction Contract to Tennis and Track Company. So Mayor and Council, as we the memo indicates, we uh, put out for bid on SciQuest, the, the state's uh, procurement website, uh, to, to uh, get bids for a post-tension concrete basketball court that will uh, have uh, full jazz uh, logos and, and striping and painting, et cetera. That's uh, actually the, the court at Centennial will be at Centennial Park and it will have a, we, we received a $10,000 grant from the Utah Jazz to help pay for that. Uh, we received just the one, the one bid on that from Tennyson Track Company, who is the premier uh, uh, constructor, uh, con contractor for post-tension courts in the state of Utah. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Any questions? So the the money we received years ago from Sean Bradley goes towards this as well, right? Correct. That's correct. And Norm, when you um, when you say that is the one bid that we received, is it my understanding that it was put out to bid, and they are the only company who submitted a proposal? That is correct. Uh, we went through the entire state procurement process just like we do on large contracts just like we we did on the the one just to the that the will be coming up here subsequently and and that was the only one that we received as far as bids that's correct but we did go through the state procurement procedures and, and website uh, it was fully noticed uh, advertising the newspaper etc just like we do on on large car projects and we did have more than one that came to the pre-bidding uh, pre meeting right right where they were able to ask questions and all that type of thing, uh, but only one ended up submitting. Now this is the premier provider of this, of, of basketball courts, uh, pickleball courts, tennis courts throughout the state. And, um, and because of that, their timetable is such that they won't be able to begin this work until spring of 2021. And, and this is the same contractor that worked as a subcontractor when we built the Orchard Cove uh, basketball court and the additional tennis court that's down there they, this is the same contractor that did that work and it's still holding up fabulously okay i'd like for a motion mr mayor i'll make a motion to award the contract for the centennial park post tension basketball court project to the tennis and track company for an amount not for a not to exceed amount of $103,270. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Montoya. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Meekham. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. Item 6E, a word of the 2020 road maintenance contract and road construction contract on 300 West Park Strip widening project and North Center Street Rebuild Project, Black Forest Paving Company. So Mayor and Council, same uh, situation on this one. This is for a portion of our roads maintenance. You may have seen recently throughout town, there's a lot of, of uh, microsurfacing going on. This is a different uh, setup. This is for two inch overlays, the full reconstruct on Center Street. If you've had an opportunity to ride on that roller coaster right lately, um, that will be completely milled down concrete collars removed and, and reconstructed up 
to to a new and uh, much better surface. It will also be the completion of the 300 West uh, uh, project from 100 North to 400 North that will restore two-way traffic to 300 West. And North Center Street, north of Apple Valley Elementary. That's what I was talking about, the North Center Street. Right. Oh, sorry. It's specifically the yeah, North, that's part, correct. not the entire Center Street. <laughs> that's correct. Actually, north of Royal Land Drive, which is the, the major crossroad down there at this point in time. I go all the way from just, just south of the railroad tracks to Royal Land Drive. So on the, on 300 West, what 300 West Park Strip, what are they doing? How's this going to work? So there's a combination of things that are going to be done there. There's going to be some asphalt widening. There's going to be restriping. There's going to be uh, uh, taking the, um, the park strip that's there along the townhome portions and actually making it a, a park air parking area for the homes there. A lot of those have cars that park on them often anyway. And so this will be just basically taking out the grass and putting in uh, a concrete there so that there is some parking area there. That is actual city right of way. And so this will, will be all, all the work will be done within city right of way. So, but, but again, the, the intention there is to, is to uh, widen it in some areas. Obviously, the, the area where the townhomes exist on the west, on the east side, you can't widen it. It's, it's as far as we can go. But we can, again, improve parking in that area by, by concreting that over and making it so that there's areas to park rather than parking on, on the street itself. Sir? So I have a question. Uh, we have the North Center Street. Uh, so we understand. We understand the rolling part of it, <laughs> but is that part of that stripping that down and repaving that's going to take care of the settlement underneath? Yeah, that's actually part of the project is to is to go down on the, the storm drain trench is what you're specifically referring to that's on the eastern half of the road. There's actually about, I, I don't remember the exact length, maybe 1,400 feet of that trench that will actually be taken out half width, half depth, I'm sorry, and recompacted with structural fill, just like what we did on Ginger Gold Road many, many years ago. Same exact situation where uh, native material was used at the time and it wasn't the best for the city this is yeah this is a full reconstruct so we'll actually have a really good road there it won't finish it out to curb gutter and sidewalk or curb and gutter and storm drain but it will be we will restore what's there now with a, a much better traveling surface and the and the base itself that's correct thank you for that clarification yeah that was definitely something that we wanted to get into that project and it is in there Any thoughts on when we're going to get the curb and gutter on Center Street? Sure. How we're so, Mayor, we did, and Council, we did actually bid that out with this project. Um, you'll notice that the recommended uh, notice of award is three hundred and eighty-eight thousand. That's for f five areas in town: Center Street, Third West, and three sets of overlays. Just to to do the outside area from where the existing asphalt is now to curb and gutter and storm drain was more than this. It was about $429,000. So significantly more than, than the budget. We were hoping that it would come in better than that, but as of, so, uh, yeah. Uh, for so the public, uh, we are thinking about that. It is on our uh, radar. We know it needs to be done. So we are working on that. So thank you, Norm. Uh, I look for a motion on this then. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve a contract for the 2020 Sanaquin Roads project to Black Forest Paving for and for a not to exceed amount of $388,555.56. We have a motion by Councilman Miller. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Montoya. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. We don't have a, a formal public hearing tonight. Uh, building permits. How are we doing, Jason? Yeah, Mayor and Council. So, uh, just a, a little context. Usually, uh, staff in the Community Development Department uh, prepares these reports on the the day of uh, Council meeting, just so we can give you the most updated numbers. As you can see, uh, year to date total, uh, we it appears like we're one short of of what we did in in all of 2019. Uh, however, before staff went home today, uh, we had 18 single family homes that came in and got a permit uh, picked up this afternoon. So uh, in fact, we are, are 
are beyond what we we did all of last year and we're only in august so lots of growth happening um you know for those that that, that maybe can't see that we have a total of 190 i should say we now have a total of of 208 single family homes um and then we have 36 townhomes that have are multi-family homes sorry that have built and been built in santa quinn in this year so lots of growth and, and we're not seeing it slow down either so it'll we'll continue to see those numbers rise and and uh this will probably be a, a kind of a an outlier year if you will of of unusual growth that we're not used to seeing so uh business licenses we have uh we have four of them we have planet kingdom llc uh this is online plants order and deliveries uh we have body loop Massage, Body Love Massage, sorry, um, by Cindy Mortensen. Uh, this is massage therapy, uh, rapid mechanical, uh, air conditioning, heating, and HVAC service contractor. And then we have It Takes a Village Daycare. Um, this is a home daycare business. So um, yeah, those are our new business licenses that we've had since the last meeting. Any questions? Good, okay, thank you. Jason, on to the business. Uh, item 9A, Ordinance 0801-2020, an ordinance creating Santa Quin City Code, Title V, Chapter 2, Section 18, establishing rules for dog parks. All right, Mayor and Council, uh, this is something that uh, has come up uh, and, and we've, we've recognized the need for, and, and the reason for that is, is we've had a, a recent final plat in the hills at Summit Ridge that has been approved. And as part of that, a plat an amenity uh, of a specifically designated dog park is part of that, that, uh, that particular uh, phase of that plat. Um, Chief Hurst had, had uh, uh, grabbed me and, and indicated that it'd probably be a good idea that we have some some rules for that dog park so that we we know how to to handle any issues that might happen there and that so residents have a, a good understanding and expectation of, of what uh how they they use this this uh new amenity uh this would be the first designated dog park in santa quinn city so i'm sure that there's a lot of dog people that, that are excited about this and we're 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 happy to see it and and uh it's something that they can can use and enjoy with their dogs. So, um, this this is a this is in a Title Five of of the code. This did not go to the Planning Commission. It's not a land use code. So, this is only here for the, the council. Um, and basically, where we got this from was was uh, our past animal control officer, who still kind of maybe has a foot in that that uh, realm, uh, Officer Shepherd. He he uh, previously was was over animal control, and so I, I, I coordinated and, and talked with him about what he sees uh, these rules needing to be. And, and he contacted uh, officers in Spanish Fork City who have dog parks and 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 uh, did a little research to understand what they do for their dog parks and what rules they have. So a lot of the rules that we have here are are um, based off of what Spanish Fork uh, does for for their dog parks. Um, I mean, it's it's not terribly long. Um, really, there's there's a section that has rules. Uh, there's a section that basically talks about what's prohibited in the dog parks, uh, and then and then there's a section that just talks about uh, violations being an infraction. So, um, fairly straightforward, pretty simple. I think it'll it'll be good for for what we need. Like I say, I've coordinated with the police department on this since they'll be the the ones enforcing it, and. Uh, like I say, it's it's pretty much a model after Spanish Fork's existing rules. So I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. Okay. And I know Chief Hurst would, would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions, Council? Yeah, I have, okay, go ahead. I have questions. Okay, so first off, two, two things. In section B, line one, human and dog food slash treats are prohibited in the dog park. I'm not sure why we would prohibit dog food or dog treats being in there. Um, I think that needs to come out, in my opinion. And I have a question, uh, more for, for conversation. In section A, line five, children under the age of 13 must be accompanied by an adult. 
or supervised at all times. Um, I got, I got kids that are under 13 who could, I would prefer walk my dog to a dog park and play with them than sit inside. Um, I have a neighbor too, who's under 13 and, and takes his dog out and does everything right now. So I question if, if the age limit of 13 needs to be on there. That's just the two questions I have. Okay. You got an answer for him? Well, I'll try. Okay. Go for it. I think in, in reference to the, to the food is if, if you own dogs, you know, dogs can become aggressive when you're sharing food or when you get two different dogs in the same area. And so I think the intent behind that is to keep the dogs from, to keep a person from trying to break up a dog fight and then in essence getting bit by trying to break up that dog fight. So I think Jason's done a pretty good job encompassing the general rules. And I think we looked at Provo and some other ones too as well. So it wasn't just Spanish Fork, but in the age limit, I don't really have any I'm indifferent to the age. Well, and I would, I would think the age limit would be kind of along the same lines of, of making sure the dogs stay under control. And, and I think that's really another it. Another dog. But... I, I know as a dog owner and, and grandfather, <clears throat> the younger my, my grandchildren are, the more anxiety my dog has and the more apt to attack because they feel threatened, even though it's unintentional. So I think the age of the child can can have some impact, maybe not on your own dog where they're growing up sure. and whatnot, but on uh, uh, somebody else's dog that might be in the park. So who's yeah. not leashed and is could run free. But that's not saying it can't be whatever you need it to be. <laughs> I just was asking the question. <laughs> I'm indifferent. So any other comments? I do agree with keeping with um, the prohibition on food, but I do think, you know, when my, when my son was, was training his dog, he used treats to, to do that. And so I think if someone um, wants to use that space to help with training, then if they carry a little bag of treats in their pocket, that's not food that they're going to put out in a dish or pour on the ground or something like that. Um, but that's just my thought. Yeah, I think you, you you provide a place for these dogs to play and be trained and work with, but then you can't use treats to work with them. And I get it. I get it. We don't want bowls of food laying around and whatnot. But I question if the treat thing where you could put, unless you're training your dog, I don't know. I, I don't know. So I, I think it, it might be worth saying uh, that we probably still got a ways before a dog park is is going to happen in, in Summit Ridge. It's it's you know the development's started, but it'll it'll be a little bit maybe a, a month or two before we see the dog park completed and open. So this isn't something that you have to to, to make tonight. Like I say, I, I'm probably not the best person to talk about it because I've never owned a dog. I'm not a dog person, but. Uh, so this is not my language. This is really looking at what other cities have done and looking at best practices. And, and if you're looking for more information on, on why other cities have had those provisions, maybe they've had problems with that. Maybe they had problems with 12 year olds that can't control a dog and it gets loose and, and it, you know, I don't know. So if I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is because this isn't an urgent matter for a dog park that's going to open tomorrow, uh, we are happy to look into it a little bit more if, if you need that information to help you make the best decision. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the answer is on the best decision. Like I, I get it. Yeah. And we, we, we dealt with this, we dealt with this a while ago, right? We had, we had right. the dog situation and, and I, and I understand the seriousness and I understand how bad things can get pretty quick. I just, that's what makes it hard, right? Because it's, it's hard to tell a, a 12 year old kid or a, a 12 year old daughter you you can't take this little dog to a dog park because potentially this could happen right yeah. and so that's where it gets hard i understand and so i don't know i don't know the right answer yet. well i'm i'm okay with that with the recommended age i i think children under that age um would be fine just being supervised having having an adult with them um does it say on there or older sibling it just says supervised 
It just says supervised. By an adult and accompanied by an adult and, and supervised, supervised at all times. times. I think it's wise to have an age recommendation for sure. that. I really do. Yes, if you just give us some direction on if, if 13 isn't acceptable, what age is, and if some food is acceptable but not too much, can you define what is acceptable and what is A little baggy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in grams, ounces, I, I don't know. Yeah, you have to do it. You see, you see this, well, is, uh, this, is, this is the problem, is, is the enforcement. If it's yes, not, the yeah. enforcement issue of it. Right. I, and I understand that. Well, so I would say, I would say um, again, not food, not dog food, like kibble in a bowl or poured on the ground. I would say treats are acceptable, no larger than a sandwich bag size container. I, I think if you just if you just cross out the word treats, I think it's fine. If if someone you mean food or excuse me, if you well no, treats. the following items are, are, oh, prohibited. are prohibited. So, so okay. I think if you just human leave it at food, human yeah. and dog food. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the food portion of it is inviting the dog to stay for a while. And potentially that's have gonna, a fight. Well, have a fight or people leaving their dog for an extended period of time. And, and, and I right. think where right. Chief Hearst is coming up, so he doesn't have to get up again, is is he needs something that is enforceable, something that sure. he knows black and white what what uh is allowed and what's not allowed. And in, in this case, you know, dog food, you know, is a treat considered dog food? You know, oh. I think the whole intent no. some of those dogs smaller dogs might be the treat. <laughs> so i mean you know our, our you know, usually doesn't say much during the council meetings but he he's not comfortable with that language as as treats our dog food so it's just i guess that's what i'm saying is is i know our officers i know our attorney they they want to have clear language and and yeah. like council member miller mentioned you know three years ago uh this was a a very sensitive topic and so we just want to make sure we have good language in place that makes it clear for everybody involved it's only been three years. What about what about no open food, right? So no open dog food, and then the treats must be concealed on the dog owner, right? And then if you're working a dog, you you pull a treat out. You're saying that. If, and, if you're concerned and, about that, we might might want to bring it back because you you can get into some real interesting uh, cases there when you're talking about the difference between. Food and treats, treats and <clears throat> nutritional value. For me, and along the lines of Nick, I, I, I'm having a, an issue with the age thing myself. Uh, I think 13 is a number you can put up there, but I would like to see the staff go back and ask and get a little more information on why they come up with that number. Because 12 year olds, as far as I'm concerned, 12 year olds are. I mean, take their dog out can, is responsible too. You got to put some responsibility back on the people. Yeah, and I I, I think you're right. And uh, my nine year old can handle right. my big dog just fine. And I would hope that the people coming to the same dog park, if they're take if their ten year old kid is taking the dog, they could handle that right. kid as well. Right. I don't, or that dog as well. I don't know. But if those two dogs got into a fight would those two same children be able to break up that fight or would you want them trying to break up that dog fight alone without an adult there? So this ordinance can be whatever you want it to be that makes sense for your community. So it's, yeah. you can make a motion to approve it striking those two lines. You can make a motion to table it so that we can go and bring you uh, further information. It's whatever you deem appropriate. Um, but, and, and this is just my supposition, um, but I would suppose that that um, the other provisions of this code uh, where the dog needs to be under voice control um, and um, as far as aggression um, means that the person has to be able to reasonably take care of the, um, of that dog. So my five-year-old grandson could not do that, but without some sort of a line, where is that line? Is it five? Is it 13? Is there somewhere in between? You know, where, what, what makes sense for us as a community? 
that's really what's before you. But but I, I look at that I look at that statement though, and it says you're at this point you're putting the responsibility back on the parents to, to be able, if you've got an aggressive dog, you know you've got an aggressive dog, and that dog shouldn't be at the park according to that anyway. Right? right. But what if let's say let's say I have happen to have a ten year old child, and I'm at work all day long, and my ten year old child takes my dog down to the park. I, I didn't know that they did. It gets an aggressive, gets in a fight, bites another kid or bites another dog. Um, am I at fault because my 10 year old child did that? Probably so, but that's the ordinance is clearly stating that my 10 year old shouldn't be there at all unless they're supervised by an adult. You know, so it's really whatever makes sense for you. We're, we're happy to all the way through this whole time as Jason was putting this together, he just kept going. <laughs> I'm not a dog person. I don't really care. <laughs> Rod, you know, uh, our officer, well, Kay, I, I Kayson, you like put it together what makes sense. We got a little bit of time, man. Uh -huh. I don't see any reason why not look at, let's look at sure. that and why those cities came up. With Absolutely. That. So you want to table it? I, I think just one more thing on the age. I think um, it's one thing to have a child younger than 13 take the dog for a walk around the neighborhood mm -hmm. on the leash and they're close to home if they're just going around the block or something it's it's different to ask a young child a younger child to take the responsibility of taking their dog to the park letting it off the leash and the what ifs that's that's a pretty big responsibility Mayor, if I may, I, I think this is also for the protection of the children as well, because, yeah. you know, again, there's two people at the dog park. One may happen to have it be an adult and have a, a much larger dog that could actually weigh more than a 13 year old. And, and I believe it's, it's as much for the protection of the dog as it is for the children. My, my yeah. two cents. I'm fine with the 13 age myself. Just because it's different in my mind taking a dog to a dog park again versus asking around a block. child to walk the dog around the block on a leash. Yeah. So this we ran into this with uh, the last incident issue, very long conversation about dogs. It it went against our own city dog. So what are we gonna do about service do we need to look at service animals for this do we need to do so this is only within the fenced area of this dog park sure um and it really shouldn't i mean you're taking your dog out of that dog park you're letting it off you should be in control of that dog um whether it's voice control or whatever so this is a ordinance designed for a very limited square footage um my two cents if, if we're gonna have two cents is i i really like consistency with other cities, you know, as far as being an outlier one way or another, that's the only thought I have, but I'm a dog lover. Um, my, my, my dog is very small, but he thinks he's five times as big as he is and likes to go after your dogs. And, and, uh, so we always have to keep him a little bit closer for that reason. Well, and I don't, yeah. I, I mean, it's, this is just my thoughts. I'm, I, I, I probably won't, use this dog park personally but uh, okay. it's just just my thoughts if you want to okay. investigate it and the age of 13 we can if you want to leave it at this then that's fine i just personally not. i think we leave it where it's at the way they've got it written let's let's get it if we want to make a change we can make a change but we're happy to do whatever okay. yeah honest. i know you are i'm fine with that is there a statement um sorry i don't have the whole thing memorized is there a statement that that specifically um, requires the dog not be left unsupervised? Yeah, yes. or it says dog, go back up, dog handlers must be within the dog park and supervising their dog with leash readily available. Okay, great. I look for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we, adopt ordinance 08-01-2020 and ordinance creating Santa Quinn City Code Title V Chapter 2 Section 18 establishing rules for dog parks. We have a motion by Council Member Montoya. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a second by Councilman Meekham. 
Any further discussion on this ordinance? If not, Councilman Hathaway. No. Councilman Meekham? Yes. Council Member Montoya? Aye. Yeah. Councilman Miller? No. Uh oh. How you, can, my how friend. I fix this. <laughs> This is where I say, hey, we have a tie, Mr. Mayor. I'm, try, I'm trying to think of, I've done it twice now. And one was on the, the rodeo lights. And the other one was, do you remember what it was? Yeah. No, I don't either. I vote I on it. So that's 3-2. Yes. All right. Thank you. Item 9B, Resolution 0806-2020, a resolution amending the Santa Quin City Uniform Bail Schedule for fines applicable to criminal violations of various Santa Quin City ordinances in reference to dog parks. Uh, Mayor and Council, this was recommended to come forward uh, uh, with regard to supporting the previous action of the Council. Um, as an infraction and it has a, a recommended $50 fine. That fine amount can be adjusted um, within the range of an infraction, um, but it's whatever you would have us move forward with. Thoughts, Council? Less, more? I need to have something there. Yeah. I need to have something. It couldn't be a fine. I need to have something that. It needs some teeth. Yeah. I Chief, agree. Is that, is that reasonable for you? Okay, any other comments? If not, I look for a motion. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve or adopt resolution number 0806 2020, a resolution amending the Santa Cruz City Uniform Bell Schedule for fines applicable to criminal violations of various Santa Cruz City ordinances. We have a motion by Councilman Meekham. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Montoya. Any further discussion on this resolution? If not, Councilman Miller. Aye. Council Member Montoya. Aye. Councilman Meekham. Aye. Councilman Hathaway. Aye. Thank you. Item 9C, discussion of possible action regarding the purchase of replacement cardiac monitoring units for the Santa Quin ambulances utilizing Santa Quin City Fire Department prior year's fund balance. Mayor and Council, I, I sent a letter in and since then I actually received more information including when I was sitting here from our representative. First, I'm willing to pay for these monitors out of reserve funds that we've set aside. Um, I was just notified that these qualify for the CARES Act fund, um, that we can utilize that free grant. But with that Ryan, being said- Can I just have you pop absolutely. Can I just have you pull it up to your? Oh, I thought you were trying to talk. <laughs> you, so, may have, you may have to get on your knees, so. though. <laughs> no. <laughs> that comes later to bed. <laughs> With that being said, uh, to utilize the, the CARES fund to help purchase these, I'm still asking to be able to pull money out of my reserve account for another agency. Um, our police department has some civil unrest right now, and they do not qualify to purchase some riot gear, some helmets for our officers. So, by allowing me to pull reserve funds from one department to help pay for an item that does not qualify under the CARES Act, it's a win-win situation for us. So I'm still willing to pull all the way up to the, the amount I've requested. Um, the, the version one monitor we've had for eight years, the motherboard just has no longer available. That was not something that was on our radar until that phone call came in and I was more than a little ticked at her. Um, I reached out to the other providers of defibrillators and cardiac monitors used by other agencies throughout the state and there's three three manufacturers zoll physio control and the new what used to be phillips if i stay with the physio control what we currently have i just have to replace our cardiac monitors we get to keep all of our accessories our batteries they match up with all the aeds we have in all of our government buildings our patrol cars and everything and so i don't have to buy the battery charge of the batteries if i go with the other ones it's substantially more 60 to a hundred thousand dollars more to swap. So we're just asking that that be considered and allow that to happen. And I know talking with Chief Hurst, he needs a couple sets of riot gear, but also all of our officers need a, a ballistic helmet and those aren't cheap. 
So that's something that I feel from the fire department with the city assisting us, we can turn around and assist them and free that up now because our officers are going throughout the county and sometimes the state capital to assist. So just kind of a win-win for all of us. Good, thank you. Any other comments, any questions for Chief? So if I understand your recommendation correctly, you're recommending that we, that Santa Quin City acquire um, physio control life pack uh, cardiac monitors in the amount of $67,916 utilizing CARE Act dollars instead of utilizing fire department reserve fund dollars and that the council would authorize our fire chief and police chief to work together for the acquisition of ballistic gear and or other uh, safety materials needed by our police department, um, inclusive of potentially acquiring some radios in an amount up to $67,916. Well said. So moved. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, you got it. We have a motion by Councilman. Who said it first? He Miller? just he just beat me by the buzzer. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Council Member Montoya. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Thank you. Item 9D, Resolution 0807-2020, a resolution approving an infrastructure deferral agreement for the Erkenbrack two lot subdivision. So Mayor and Council, this was uh, 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 extension of a request that was made by Mr. Erkenbrack that the council was considering uh, last meeting a, a deferral agreement. This is an expansion of that deferral agreement to defer uh, under a two lot scenario rather than a three lot scenario for, for Mr. Erkenbrack's proposed subdivision to defer the water line because the water line is actually already there for the lot that he wants to create. He won't be extending any lines and therefore it doesn't doesn't fall under the, the maximum length of water line that is currently under code because it's not being expanded. Um, but I would I would qualify this by saying the packet has the drawing for the three lot subdivision because that's all we had. We would substitute that last page for a two lot subdivision that I got just during our work meeting tonight. So that would be the only stipulation if you make a, a motion on this is that we insert that most recent document that I received this evening as the final uh, sheet in this document. Doesn't, doesn't lot one have a, a house already? It does, that's correct. And then lot two is where they would put a house. That's correct. And that's that's it? That's correct. Okay. okay. So are they just going to be tapping into the existing line? They, they would be, yes. And they then just for sewer use a septic? septic because they're not within the, the 300 feet of our code or the state code, that's correct. But then if they want to develop a third lot, then they have to add the that, sewer. That would kick in. That, that that would kick in the water line, not the sewer line. Oh, okay. They could yep. still use septic for the for, third for a house. third lot potential future lot. That is correct because that's allowed in the county, and it's not within three hundred feet of our of our sewer lines. But they would have to add to the water line. That is correct. Okay. But that's the looping that Mr. Erkenbach discussed last time when he was here and, and asked the council to consider something different we went back to the drawing board and and worked to, to come up with this solution and it's it's amiable to him and it works for the city code thank you for okay. thank you for doing that norm staff any other comments questions i look for a motion mr mayor make a motion that we approve resolution 0807 2020 resolution approving infrastructure deferral agreement for the year to back to lots of we have a motion by Councilman Meekham. Do I have a second? second? We have a second by Councilman Hathaway. Any further discussion on this resolution? If not, Councilman Meekham. Aye. Councilmember Montoya. Aye. Councilman Miller. Aye. And Councilman Hathaway. Aye. Thank you. It was unanimous. All right. No need to convene a agency, an authority, or a district tonight. Uh, reports, Benjamin. Um, Mayor and Council, we're we're actually working on on several different uh, projects and and areas within our city. Um, our new city hall, of course. Um, you've approved the architectural agreement this evening. We're working on the financing and completing that work uh, to get that moving forward, and uh, and everything is kind of falling into place in, in with regard to that project. So we're very appreciative of that. Um, 
<clears throat> we're also um, uh, working on upcoming meeting items that would be inclusive of, of um, um, the annexation of 500 West, um, and, which is a new road that the city put in behind Santa Quinn Elementary School and ensuring that that road is within our city limits so that we can receive class C road funds to help maintain that road. Uh, that's not currently within our city limits. And so that's important for us. Um, we are also um, working on an ordinance for uh, group demonstrations and a process that uh, the public would need to follow for group demonstrations and clearly outlining the, the authority and, and backing of our uh, police officers. Um, we're gonna be having some uh, projects coming forward uh, with regard to the EWP project, that's emergency watershed that, that uh, Norm talked about in our work meeting uh, with regard to high water coming off of the mountain as a result of the, the burn over conditions. Uh, transportation master plan is, is um, nearing completion as well as our public safety master plan. Um, that will likely come forward, not on the September 1st meeting, but September 15th so that we can uh, pass those plans by the Home Builders Association and they have an opportunity to take a look at that, that work that has been done by our third party providers. Um, we have a whole bunch of ordinances coming through from Planning Commission that I'll, I'll have uh, uh, Jason talk to um, and th that was recommended by our, our council members here and our volunteer of the month for, for uh, September 1st would be on that meeting as well. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the public is going to be uh, receiving information soon. Um, our businesses have already received information about the Santa Quinn City Economic Stimulus Program that has been authorized by our mayor and council. We're very excited uh, to try to put dollars uh, from the CARES Act fund into the hands of our residents that can be used within our, our businesses um, and keeping local dollars local, local and shopping and supporting our local businesses. So a lot of communication is going to be coming forth, but basically, uh, the program starts September 1st and ends September 30th. So there's a very short window and uh, you'll see more information on Facebook, on our website, in the mail, and um, and you'll be able to have more opportunity to learn about that in the days ahead. Is there any questions that you have for me? No. Uh, Norm. For us. So, Mayor Council, as you saw from the awards tonight, we've got projects continuing to move forward in Santa Quin and, and things are looking good that way. Um, we also have our water and pressure irrigation uh, updates to our master plans that are on the front doorstep now. We're in a review on the first, uh, first round draft of that. We do not anticipate that coming in the September 15th meeting, but probably sometime in October, we'll be bringing that to you and, and having that discussion on uh, needed infrastructure and updating those plans and adopting those plans. That's that's going very well. Um, happy to report that the that the uh, east side furniture road has been open. You can drive all the way around town on asphalt now without getting on the freeway or going down the furniture road on the west side of the freeway. But uh, I, I I don't know of any concerns there. There 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 is just so you're aware there is still continuing construction along that road. They're getting the fence in. And they will be doing an asphalt trail and and landscaping in there over the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, but that is happening and moving forward. And, and we have traffic now on that road and, and it looks great. On that subject, um, we do have the engineering back and it's being reviewed by UDOT right now for the next phase, which is the intersection at Island Drive and Canyon Road. With UDOT approvals, that allows us to start uh, negotiating for the acquisition of property there. Yeah, that's the last leg through the piece that... that uh, Foothill Village does not own. And so, so why we need we need uh, UDOT approval just so we know where the road goes, so that we can try to. Acquire so there's a little bit stuff. of uh, there's a small minor couple minor impacts on UDOT for some some catch points on embankments that need to be built to be able to put the road in there. So there's just some minor UDOT impacts as far as embankments and and a little bit of storm drainage embankment as well that. <laughs> It's pretty minor, but because it does affect right next to their property and they have purview over that, it, it does have to be reviewed by them. Wait, so so that's fine, but but maybe I misunderstood. So we got to get the UDOT stuff first before we can acquire the property from the property owner, or right. do we have to acquire UDOT? In case UDOT has any changes, we don't want to have to 
renegotiate with the property owner. If yeah, they, if they say you've got to move this three feet or 10 feet or whatever, then we would have to go back to the property owner to negotiate something different if they're, if they're changes and the, from the UDOT review. And the property owner is, he's, he's amenable. The, We've met before and it's it, been very favorable. So we just, we just need to get these exact lines of what we that, need and where we're at. That's exact, correct. So that, that's what we're at. And exact and, square footage and, and all of the, um, uh, um, uh, improvements that would be needed for the support of his property as well as ours, what's his responsibility versus ours, and then negotiate uh, a, a, an agreement that would be beneficial for us to ac acquire that property and allow this whole project to move forward. And and the UDOT process is uh, very slow at times, I feel. Um, we have in, an in idea? In this particular case, it's, it's, it's my understanding they're going to be reviewing it within the next week to week and a half. Right. So it's couple months we, we, we expect to have <laughs> comments back by i think it's the 26th if i remember I correctly we'd have like a direction we're oh. going in a oh, couple yeah. months it, the impacts on them are months. very minor so it just has to be reviewed by a, a specific uh, number of a, a couple of departments but we just don't want feel comfortable moving forward with acquisition until udot's given their blessing no that's that's fine that makes sense good deal anything else man uh, I'm sure there's more, but I happy any to answer questions any for questions one? that you have for for me. I, again, uh, the asphalt around town, the, the surfacing is is incredible. Uh, so grateful for uh, the opportunity there to have this done done for our city. Uh, in fact, I I seen it. I've seen it all over town. So it's just not one area getting getting it it's it's all over so so mayor just to, and council just to follow up on that yes we we have uh, been able to to get to a point now where we're catching up on maintenance that has been not been able to to have been done over many 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 years because bnc road funds from the from the gas tax doesn't cover all of it so we we are and the mayor's got a great point we are at a point now where we are Yes, we still have some roads that are bad. Center Street's a good example in other areas, but we are at a point now where we are able to do some preservation coats that will lengthen the life of roads out five to 20 years longer than if we did nothing to them. And and the, the cost of that preservation coat is called a microsurface, gives us a new wearing surface as well as a, as well as a, as a resurfacing of the oil that oxidizes over time and causes the, the roads to break down so we, we are getting to a point now where where we are actually able to to take a breath and, and we still have a lot of work to do but we're getting to the point where we can start doing a lot of these preservation coats to not have to run into the full reconstructs that we've had in the past in the overlay so it's it's, it's been very good and the, and yes you're you're right man we the a lot of town has seen uh, some either overlays or microsurfacing over the last six or so years. Okay. Nothing else from Ron. Uh, Jason. Yeah. So uh, last Friday, we our, our position closed for a new building inspector. Uh, I'm going to be sitting down with the building official tomorrow to to look through those applications. We had a total of 32, so we have quite a few to go through and. <clears throat> We're anticipating doing some uh, interviews next week sometime. I'm going to, it's one of the things after the meeting, I want to connect with, with Councilmember Montoya to see what her schedule is like so we can conduct some interviews and hopefully we can get five or six good candidates to interview. Um, this coming Friday is when the, um, the proposals for the general plan update uh, close. Um, we did have a, 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 uh, mandatory pre-proposal meeting in which we had nine firms uh, attend. So we're expecting that we'll have nine proposals that we'll be looking at. Uh, and again, with that, uh, once we get those those in next week, we'll, we'll uh, 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 detail a process to, to go through that. And and uh, I've already talked with the mayor about, about uh, some council members and, and others to participate on in, in being on that selection committee. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, uh, last week, I spoke on the phone with representatives at Utah State University. Uh, we were trying to, to nail down some dates for for the uh, the study that our students in the landscape, architecture, and environmental planning department are going to be doing for us. This is related to the agritourism vision uh, at the South Interchange. 
uh, and all that open area that's there. Um, for purposes of, of the stakeholders, um, there is a meeting where they want to, to sit down and this would be um, over Zoom. Uh, likely, I think that they would probably come down here and anybody who could attend in person, we would, we would love to have them come, but, but it's something that obviously we would, we would uh, accommodate for anybody who, who doesn't wanna be here in person, but all of the stakeholders, we're, we're gonna send uh, an invitation out, <laughs> out to them so that they can plan accordingly, but um, they had a couple dates picked uh, they were looking at Friday, September 11th or Monday, September 14th. I felt like September 14th probably would be a better day, uh, particularly in our work meeting, talking about a potential event being on September 12th. Uh, I think the Monday just is, is a little bit easier than, than having it at the very, very end of the week. So if you're okay with September 14th, I'll, I'll confirm that with Utah State and, and we'll, we'll be in touch with all the stakeholders so that they can be there. Uh, to go in a little bit depth, this is this meeting is, for lack of a better word, is is more of an orientation type meeting to to help all the stakeholders understand that students will start contacting them and asking questions and and getting information from them so they can understand uh, what they uh, what what information they need to to give a a uh, a good feasible vision. So uh, and there there's opportunity for our stakeholders to start providing input as well. So. That's the, the, the nature of the meeting. There's other dates that, that haven't been solidified, but, but I'll continue to work with them so they, they can be solidified so that uh, the mayor and council and obviously all the other stakeholders can put it on their calendar and plan accordingly. So if you're okay with September 14th, Monday being, being a time, we'll, we'll do that. And, and then we'll send you an, um, um, an email so that you guys can get that on your calendar. Um, I think that's pretty much it from for me. Okay. Unless you have any questions. For any me. questions for Jason? Thank you. Uh, Council, any reports? Councilman Hathaway. I just have, I, I, I had the conversation with Judy today, the seniors. Um, of course, you know, they're in that same color issue that we all are. Um, she did get, she received some masks from Mountainlands and has been going up to the seniors. For any seniors that, that wanna come and pick up some, of course, none of them is gonna get any, but uh, they are reaching out to all the seniors to check on them and make sure they're okay, okay. and if they okay. need anything. So Good. they're doing okay. Okay. Councilman Meekham, any uh, report? Uh, okay. Councilman Member Montoya. Um. Okay, so the Youth City Council is going to is going to resume their monthly meetings in September, um, but we're going to meet at a park pavilion to still try to give a little fresh air and social distance and space to the kids on Youth Council, but resume meetings um, to get to keep moving forward with service projects and activities in the city. Um, I would also like to thank Public Works and those involved in the road projects um, this summer. Those have been exciting to see all over town. Um, the Planning Commission is still discussing changes to the um, MSR, the Main Street Residential Zone, and working on that. Um, I attended a meeting last week. Um, it was a Fine Arts Committee meeting. Um, John Bradley organized that and there were several in attendance and um, and I really look forward to working with John and other members of the community in trying to build and support fine arts in our community. So that's an exciting thing happening. And then I had emailed um, you, Mayor and Ben about wanting to learn <laughs> about the possibility of a citywide impact mitigation plan for development. Um, we have found ourselves the last couple of years in difficult circumstances and situations, trying to catch up or make up as best we can from decisions that were made um, up to 20 or 22 years ago with development agreements. Um, and we cannot change the development agreement and we cannot get out of the development agreement. It's a legally binding document. But what we can do is learn. 
we can try to learn from um, the experiences of our residents as these developments have come to fruition now, um, 20 years after they were agreed to. And we can take that information and, and try our best to make better decisions moving forward. And um, I think one of the ways to do that is to take a serious look at an impact mitigation plan for all future development in the city. So that's just an, an idea that some residents talked with me about. I thought it was a good idea. Um, I appreciate Ben responding. I appreciate all of the work and time and effort that, that Ben and Norm put into working with developers and addressing resident concerns and the changes up to this point that have already been made to try to improve and do better and so I, I hope for continued support moving forward just to learn about what kind of a plan we could put in place um, because we know we're going to keep growing. Yep, I agree. I agree. So that's what I have tonight. All right, thank you. Nick? Uh, yeah, a few things. So police department is just business as usual. Things are going good. They're grateful for the dog ordinance that was passed today. It's easy for them to enforce. Recreation. How did you know that? It's going to be <laughs> <laughs> uh, re recreation had soccer tryouts. It was good. It, I, I went there a couple times. Uh, it was good. Flag football signups are going on. Things are going well. Uh, two last things. Question. Uh, question for anyone um, update with DNR. I know they posted on their Twitter that that shooting range was closed. Um, have they received our letter? Have they stated anything? So they, I, I received an email uh, last council meeting two weeks ago is when that, that resolution or that letter of support and concern went out. And I, I forwarded that to DNR the following day. Uh, I got an email back from the contact that I have at the local DNR saying that we forwarded that up the chain of command and I've not heard anything back. I, I did reply to him and said, we're anxious to hear, you know, future plans and, and what can be done and all that kind of stuff. But I, if, if there's a Twitter account out there, which I'm not on that, that has indicated that I, I was not aware of that. And, and uh, we've not been formally um, informed of any action that they've taken or, or anything there. So it just, it had a list of multiple spots that were closed. Um, I think they were classifying it as a uh, fire, uh, they close it because of potential fire, um, which is fine. I don't really care the reason. Question I have, the, the real question I have is, is uh, DR, or DR Horton has done a good job, not, excuse me, not DR Horton, but the road has done a good job. The, the road's in and there's a gate there, but right next to the gate, it's very easy for vehicles to drive around, right? And I understand this is not in Santa Quin City, my assumption is, I think it's, it's not, not in It's Quin not in Santa Quin City. So, so we're closing this, but the question I have is, is could we work with either ourselves and just do it, or could we work with the county and just put a Jersey barrier right there? You'll see it if you look. There's one access point in, and the gate is pretty much non-existent because you can drive literally a, a truck right around and go in there. Now, I was out on Sunday, and and there was a lot of a lot of tracks from dirt on on the new road right so it seemed like there's a lot of activity coming in and out of there and i just thought if we put one of those big cement jersey barriers i think is what they're called but if we just block that off it would make it a little harder to get in there i know it's not our, our area and i get that but if there's someone we could work with or just simply do so it and Depending on where the gates at, that could be county property. I could visit with the county engineer and, and public works director and see if we could, if there's something we could do and, there. And when you go out there, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And and uh, Mitchell with the, the road has done a good job of putting those Jersey barriers down at the end by our stop sign. But I just literally think if we could put one, it would really impact the cars and trucks being able to go in there. Right. So that's so I did yeah, see it still being used. So. I did see a county sheriff out there uh, parked at one point, but with permission of the county 
uh, we we're, we were certainly in a position that we could gift them one and just set it there for them. So yeah, yeah. right. I, I think so, so. So it goes. The road is on UDOT property. Right behind the road is county property, and right behind the county property is the shooting range, which is DNR. So I believe we have an opportunity to at least work with the county there to to put a jersey barrier. If that's what you direct us to do, we can certainly I, look into that. I would think so. There's a yeah. big there's a big uh, uh, a ditch right next to it. As long as you don't impede my access for emergency response, I'm okay. You it wouldn't because okay. as long as I have access for a brush truck to get back up there, if not other cars. Lane. There's still a gate, right? There's still a gate. Yeah. 100. Well, as long as that, we have an access to that gate. Oh yeah. This is this is just on the side of the gate. This, this is going around the fence. Yeah. This would literally just be like a just extending a fence. But you'll you'll yeah. see it when you go out there. So the last the last thing I have, and and I I apologize if I cross my lane. Um, I really do. I'm not I'm not trying to cause any any rifts, but um. Dr. Horton is is going to come in and a, and approach us about a phasing plan change. Correct? That on the new phase they wanted to, just to change a couple things. I, I the uh, Foothill Village. There, there's they wanted. My understanding was they wanted just to simply change a little bit of a layout. So there's something that maybe they would need to change, but our art, the DRC directed them that 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 just doesn't meet the preliminary and they either need to meet that or they can afford it. You're talking about phases Y and Z? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, it really the ball's in their court in, in terms of whether or not they want to combine those phases the way it's shown on their preliminary plan or whether they want, they want to do it separately. If It looks like they'll probably do it separately because they're different residential uh, unit types, which makes sense because one unit type might have common space attached to it, which would then require an HOA to, to oversee that. So anyways, go ahead. So, so, so that's, that's good. I, and I don't have a problem working with them. I think they approached us and I think we have a good working relationship. The problem that I have is, is, and I've only heard, and, and to be for hundred percent transparent, I've only heard one side of the story. So I have not had a chance to talk to DR Hort, but I am strongly encouraging our city staff who has this relationship, we have to encourage these guys to use the south exit, right? We need to do this because they're not listening when the residents ask and they're not listening when we ask, assuming we have been asking, right? We need them to use that. And I know in the past they have expressed concern that it's longer. Well, I did some studying today and it's actually one minute, 94 seconds quicker to stay on the freeway and go up the second exit. Now, the, the reason why I'm, I'm getting frustrated is, is because they're not using it. And I, I, drove, I drove this road uh, multiple times today and I ran it today as well for my run. But the cement trucks were just constantly going down Canyon Road and then down Center Street. And I think, and I know the residents understand that it's a public road and the residents are not asking for the road to be shut down. They're just asking to be heard. We have the exit. We we know we know we we couldn't control how this happened. We know we want to prevent this from happening in the future. But can we please just ask these guys to use the second exit? Now, long story short, I remember about uh, 15 years ago, I actually worked for a contractor who worked for Dr. Horton, and they were very strict. And we, they had rules. If you don't take off your shoes, when you go into a finished house, you don't get paid. You park in the driveway, you don't get paid. All we're simply asking is for them to please use the second exit. We're not requiring it. We're not, at, we're not doing that. And I think that's in our lane, in my lane specifically, just to ask them to please send an email to your contractors. The, the contractors were always there, right? The big guys who are constantly there, send an email just encouraging them to use that south exit and help with the traffic there. And now that the road's open, we we will do that again. We've we've done that a handful of times yes. in the past. In fact, we we had them come in and meet with me in my office that, one that time as well. That might be something that all we, parties and yeah. But I I I agree with with Nick. In fact, I even saw a garbage dumpster uh, company come in that other way. Uh, it's always. And it's just been so easy for them just to go down to the, and go in. I, it needs to trickle down, not right. only to DR and Mitchell, but it got it has to trickle down to all of them, all the subs that are in there. 
uh, they need to be. And in fact, uh, and, and we could even take it one step further. I think your idea is great because obviously the mayor has a little bit more more uh, uh, influence than, than we do sometimes with, with these types of people. But we're happy to also have our building inspectors as they talk with these contractors to let them know that it's two minutes quicker to go the other way and it will go a long way to, to alleviate some of the concerns that residents in the area are are having and i think i think they do they do do a really good job they do do a good job and i do believe that dr is probably one of our better contractors that we've been working with from what i've seen right and, I, and i'm not asking don't use 900 south and center Street. i'm not saying that like i'm just saying please try to use the other did you drive the speed limit oh i did 100 percent, 100 percent the speed <laughs> limit i got stopped listen i got stopped by two lights all the stop signs. I just did it like a normal, like a normal, a normal <laughs> obeying the law resident would do. That must have been very difficult. <laughs> that's not true at all. It was easy. But that's all I have. Thank you for listening. All right. I need a report on Miss Santa Quinn pageant that was held last Thursday night. Um, a little late because uh, of course the pandemic that we've been all experiencing. Uh, the girls hung in there, though. There was nine participants. And the new Miss Santaquin is Addie Huff. And for your information, she's the granddaughter of uh, former Mayor DeGraff and Reed. Uh, first attendant is Emmy McDowell. Uh, second attendant is Jade Haymore. And it was uh, incredible. In fact, if I could give all of you a fist bumper, an elbow bumper, something, they are so appreciative of the city and the scholarships that are awarded. Um, personally, I think it's the best money we spend. Yeah, those girls have uh, come a long ways. And in fact, talking to the former Miss Sanaquin uh, that gave up her, her crown the other night, uh, her dad said that it's been the, most, the greatest experience in her life that's taught her so much. And I'm gonna miss. Um, uh, uh, Devin uh, Olson and uh, they were at everything and, and I know this new group will will be just as involved in, in everything so that's money well spent and I hope we can continue to do that uh, there that's all I have um, we have a need for an executive session uh, to discuss the character and professional competence or physical or mental health of an individual so I look for a motion to go into that. Mr. Mayor, before that, may I make one more comment? Yes. Um, I appreciate uh, Planning Commissioner Kyle Frankum yes. taking his turn to attend our meeting tonight. So thanks for taking the time to thanks, be here. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks all of you for being here as well. So I look for a motion. Yeah. So moved. A motion by Councilman Miller to have a second. Second. Second by Councilman Meekum. All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, the normal ones, if you could stay. Uh, any day but Friday. Yeah.